The carved glyphs of the heaven or runestone found in the sandstone foothills of southeastern Oklahoma have captured the imagination of many, yet their true providence is still a mystery. No one has any idea who carved the symbols, when they were carved, and what they mean. Circa the 1830s, it's believed the glyphs were first discovered by Indian bear hunters, and then in 1874 by white trappers. The locals coined the stone Indian Rock, assuming the Choctaw Indians had inscribed the symbols. In 1931, a local school teacher named C.F. Kremerer found the stone while hunting, and in 1923 disclosed the cryptic inscription to the Smithsonian Institution. The eight carved characters were then identified as Scandinavian runes. According to a Smithsonian specialist, a Viking expert named Frederick Pohl, an engineer scholar Richard Nielsen, and a runologist Michael Barnes, the English translation of the runes is either Gnomdal or Glomdal, possibly meaning Gnome, Glom, Sundial, or Monument Valley, or perhaps representing the Norwegian name G. Gnomdal. This sandstone slab is now known as the Hevener Runestone, named after the nearby town of Hevener. The plethora of theories who inscribed the stone includes a 1687 French expedition party, early Scandinavian German settlers, or modern-day hoaxsters. The mystery will continue till a satisfactory message can be deciphered from these eight cryptic runes. In the 1950s, a native of the city of Hevener, Gloria Farley, spearheaded the research and preservation of the Hevener runestone. Due to Gloria's repeated efforts to save and protect the runestone, in 1970, 55 acres surrounding the 40-foot cliffs of the Poto Mountain were dedicated as Hevener Runestone State Park, a park building now houses in situ the stone slab that is believed to have fallen from the above cliffs. The first time Gloria saw the stone, she noted a horizontal piece of stone appeared to function as a platform for the vertical stone. Upon her return years later, the carved stone was askew and the base destroyed from treasure hunters dynamiting the area for relics. Due to Gloria's interest in the Hevener runestone, she became a self-taught runologist and an amateur epigrapher. Epigraphy is the study of ancient inscriptions. In 1994, Gloria published a notable and very comprehensive book titled In Plain Sight, Old World Records in Ancient America dispelling preconceived myths about the origins of many artifacts found in the Americas. Physically, the runes are hard to overlook because of their height of six and a half, up to nine and a half inches, which makes them huge in comparison to the smaller size fonts on the European rune stones that were used mainly as memorials, tributes, and markers. Gloria likened the Savannah sandstone slab to a billboard because of its size of 10 by 12 by 16 feet with the inscription stretching 69 inches or 5.75 feet across. Each rune is 3 quarters to 1 inch wide and etched 3 sixteenths to a quarter inch into the stone. Story has it that Kremerer evidently found two other inscribed stones on the cliff top, 74 steps back from the edge. Reportedly, each was carved with the second and the fourth rune out of the eight carved runes. However, if they existed, they were never recovered. One big question of the providence of these runes is, did the Norse actually travel to Oklahoma? Due to the style of runes used, they are believed to be linked to the Viking Age, 733 to 1066 AD. But scholars and aficionados question if the Vikings actually traveled to the New World during the European Middle Ages. However, why wouldn't they? The Vikings made it to the Holy Land to fight for Christianity during the Crusades. And throughout time, Viking travelers have been known to visit the Middle East, vast areas of Europe, Iceland, and Greenland. Thousands of Arabic coins of the Viking Age that were minted in southern Iraq have been found on the Swedish island of Gotland. Therefore, why is it so far-fetched that they could have crossed the Atlantic to discover the landmass known as America? Hardy souls may have forded the biting cold to reach North America, but my guess is that they traversed the Atlantic at a time of global warming during the Middle Ages, or what is called the Medieval Warming Period. Pure blind luck, or perhaps some knowledge of the Saragossa ocean currents, could have easily deposited seafaring ships into the Gulf of Mexico. 
It's then plausible that an expedition party journeyed up the Mississippi to the Arkansas River for a day's walk to the Runestone, or perhaps continued their journey from the Arkansas to the Potu River for an even shorter trek to the Potu Mountain. Was the area considered a sacred space? And are runes magic? The protected ravine of the Potu Mountain appears to have been an impromptu holy space that are commonly seen in many areas throughout Europe. This sacred grove would have been used to honor and thank the gods for safe passage, ask for continued protection in their travels, and to mourn those who died in their perilous journey. To the Vikings, the act of carving runes releases the power of fate that is inherent to these magic symbols. In the Vikings' mindset, words create reality, for language is inherent to the thought process that weaves the thread of words into the physical fabric of our existence. Runes were a means of communication between the natural and supernatural. Laws that govern energy and matter for sound, vibration, and frequency are the foundation of the power of motion in our physical universe. The true power and magic of the fluid motion of our awakening consciousness brings our thoughts and ideas into the physical realm through knowledge that transforms into wisdom. Wisdom is the ultimate quest of the Viking All-Father Odin, who is the god of wisdom, magic, poetry, prophecy, and the runic alphabet. The concept of writing was borrowed from the Romans, but Latin letters were normally not used because stone and wood carving required straight lines and few curves. The Heavener rune master probably spoke and understood a number of Semitic languages, to include Old Norse, Latin, Old English, and most likely Greek. During the Viking Age, language was no barrier for communication across the Norse-occupied lands. From Greenland to the Baltic, nearly the same languages were spoken throughout. Old English was very similar to Old Norse, and so is Icelandic, which supplied the poetry for oral history that later was put to pen and paper in the 13th century. The Vikings traded throughout Europe, as far east as Central Asia, and sold goods such as honey, tin, wheat, wool, wood, iron, fur, leather, fish, and walrus ivory, and bought materials such as silver, silk, spices, wine, jewelry, glass, and pottery. Such trade required them to know various languages. From the 12th to approximately the 17th century, runes were mainly used for commemorative inscriptions, linking the living with the dead. What is the translation of the Heavener runes into English letters? To date, no one's translated a comprehensive message from this group of eight runes. In 1967, Norwegian-born Alf Monge, a former army cryptanalyst, and the runologist Michael Barnes translated an alternative version of the runes from Nomdal into the English letters G-A-O-M-E-D-A-T, and I agree with them. Thus, it appears two runic alphabets were used. Six of the eight Hevener runes are from the oldest runic alphabet, the Elder Futhark, used by Germanic tribes from circa 150 to 800 AD, which minimally survived past 800 AD for posterity and cultural identity reasons. Runes were a cohesive bond of their societies. Many of the Elder Futhark messages were only one or two words, which most often represented a name. In fact, Elder Futhark used a proto-Old Norse language, and when the Younger Futhark alphabet emerged is when the Old Norse language was born, for the standard runic alphabet of the Viking Age was the Younger Futhark. The six Elder Futhark runes are in black, and the two in white are in Younger Futhark. Old Norse and variations of the Scandinavian languages were distinctly richer in sounds than Old English, and with the inception of Latin, the Vikings streamlined some runes to represent a number of sounds. Thus, the Elder Futhark alphabet was modified into the Younger Futhark alphabet. Keep in mind that letters in any alphabet combine to make words, but runes and letters alone are sounds. In the Younger Futhark, an A expressively represented the sound of A, E, and O as well. By concentrating a number of sounds into various runes, the 24 Elder Futhark runes were reduced to 16 Younger Futhark runes. The transition time from Elder to Younger Futhark started circa 750 AD. 
and many inscriptions of that time period contain both elder and younger Futhark runes as the older Norse language evolved. The Anglo-Saxon Futhark alphabet was believed to be used to write Old English and was the alphabet used to translate the Kensington and Narragansett runestones in my last video. Both the younger Futhark and the Anglo-Saxon Futhark remained in use until circa 1250 AD. The dramatic change in their linguistic world was due to exposure to other cultures from their expansive travel exploits during the Viking Age. The remaining two of the eight Avenir runes are from the Swedish-Norwegian Younger Futhark alphabet, known as short twig or rock runes. The use of the Younger Futhark runes in the Heavener runestone was most likely to differentiate the distinctive sounds of similar letters that one can surmise had different meanings. At the time, the Younger Futhark was divided into two main alphabets, the Danish Long Branch and the Swedish-Norwegian Short Twig. The Rock runestone, now in Ostergotland, Sweden, exhibits the longest known runic inscription carved in granite and marks the beginning of Swedish literature. The top section of the rock rune is in Elder Futhark, the middle is in Danish Long Branch, and the bottom is in Short Twig Younger Futhark. Judging from the use of the Short Twig alphabet and the language used, the runestone is believed to have been carved circa the 9th century, which is probably about the time the Heavener runestone was carved. This was about the time that the Old Norse belief system began to start losing ground to Christianity. The rock runestone has approximately 280 runes on the front and 450 on the back of different sizes that are read in all different directions, left to right, right to left, and as well as up and down. The rock runestone is easy to read but difficult to interpret. The long inscription has been largely regarded as impossible to completely understand. Interestingly enough, many translations contend there's a reference to the Ostrogothic king Theodoric the Great, who represented a branch of the Eastern Germanic tribes as acting emperor of the Western Roman Empire circa 500 AD, and eventually of all of the Roman Empire, which as you can see was quite extensive. And we will run into the presence of Theodoric the Great a couple times in this video. Early runic inscriptions were written from right to left as in Hebrew, and later it was more common to see inscriptions from left to right as in Latin and English. In my translation of the Heavener runestone, the runes are read from right to left as in Hebrew. So let's turn the G-A-O-M-E-D-A-T translation around for those who read English in order to understand my translation more comfortably. And then I will break them up into T-A-D E M O A G for the translation. Now it's time for a few words about abbreviations. As we've seen in many of my videos, messages such as this contain scribal abbreviations that were common to the church, and at times just shorthand abbreviations to convey the message in the smallest space possible. The Norse poem Havamal, which means words of the high one, is attributed to the Norse god Odin and was transcribed from oral history into Icelandic, circa 13th century. Havamal depicts Odin's sacrifice of hanging from the tree of life, Yagdusril, for nine days for the wisdom or secret of the runes. According to the Norse expert and professor at the University of Colorado, Dr. Jackson Crawford, Havamal had a lot of abbreviations, and seemingly the text was crammed into the space that was available to the medieval scribes. Once again, abbreviations will be important in the Heavener translation. At the time, rune writing had no space indicators, and words flowed together until later, as seen in the Kensington runestone, where a sentence of words are divided by colons. Now I'd like to explain the symbolism of the letters AG or GA. The AG appeared in the Tad Emo AG Heavener runestone translation and the GA was found on both the Kensington and Narragansett runestones, and it will be on the Poto stone, another runic stone found not far from the Heavener runestone. On the Narragansett runestone, the GA symbolism was found on the second line below a top line of runes, and the GA was emphasized in the Kensington runestone 
with the X functioning as an A instead of a G in the translated text. These two runestones are famous because the X's have a mysterious hook on them. The Elder Futhark X is believed to be directly derived from the Latin X. In the Elder and Younger Futhark, the X translates into G for Gable and means gift, giving and receiving, as well as sacrifice. To the Norse, sacrifice was a gift. In the Anglo-Saxon runic alphabet, Gable is Gaifu. The hook on the X, I believe, signifies Urus, the rune of sacrifice, and represents the letters Y, U, and V. The Urus rune is the same in the Elder and Younger Futhark alphabets. In Old English, the word Gar is Anglo-Saxon for spear, which was Odin's weapon of choice, and Grungnir was the name of his faithful spear that always found its mark. In Havamal, it was inferred that Odin impaled himself with the spear while hanging from Yagdrasil for nine days while staring into the well of Erd, also called Weird, which was their source of fate and is the origin of the English word Weird. In fact, in Havamal, Odin died and came back to life. Therefore, he sacrificed himself to himself to acquire the profound wisdom and power of the runes. In Norse thinking, Odin's sacrifice is equated to Jesus Christ's crucifixion, and the spear that pierced his body by the Roman soldier while on the cross symbolized Logos, the Word of God. The word rune means secret, mystery, or whisper, and some say it means to carve or cut. Odin's sacrifice, resurrection, and sharing of this runic knowledge was his magical gift to man, and the GA or AG symbolizes this. You'll have to watch my Kensington and Narragansett runestone translation of X with a Hook video for the full explanation of my previous findings. The AG and GA hold the symbolic concepts of Odin, gods, sacrifice, and spear, and as we'll see later in the video, the god tier represents the theme of self-sacrifice. This is about beliefs, practices, and perceptions of life through the eyes of the Norse. A complicated concept can be embodied by simple symbols recognized by all. The symbolism of Logos, made up of two letters that were seen everywhere, is the Christian chi ro symbol that is a sigla, symbol and an abbreviation. To the Christians, the XP symbols are immediately associated to the first two letters of the Greek name Christos, signifying Christ's sacrifice on the cross. To the Norse, it appears that AG and GA symbolizes Odin's gift of sacrifice for the wisdom of the runes, and the eventual V or hook that showed up later in the Kensington and Narragansett runestones represents his ever-present spear that symbolizes power and reinforces the theme of sacrifice. Amazingly, the same italicized Y-like hook on the X of the Kensington and Narragansett runestones is the same Y-like symbol found on the Seal of Zion. It's intriguing to see the very same symbol on a seal from the Holy Land dated circa 1289 compared to runestones that are dated circa mid-13th century. You'll have to watch my Seal of Zion translation, Ancestral Blood. In the following explanations, each individual rune will be profiled by an accompanying Velkomen rune card. For more in-depth descriptions of the Elder Futhark runes and to purchase a deck of these cards, visit the Winds of Jupiter website. The link is found below in the description box. To summarize, the letters used for AG in the Heavener runestone represent X for Gable, which is found in both the Elder and Younger Futhark alphabets, and A is for the younger Futhark short twig version of Ansu's. Now let's find out why there's two different A's or Ansu's runes on the Heaven or Runestone. One A is an Elder Futhark, which is not part of the AG symbolism, and the other A is in short twig younger Futhark. The Elder Futhark A represents Odin's rune, as well as communication and language to symbolize the sacrifice for the wisdom of the runes. The younger Futhark, or Rock Rune A, is in Swedish-Norwegian short twig and expands on this Odin symbolism. Let's take a look at the difference between the two A's. The elder Futhark A has the sound of the vowels in English words al and your, and the younger Futhark short twig A has a number of different sounds in Old Icelandic, Old English, and Old Norse. 
And in the Icelandic poems, the rune represents the members of the Osir tribe of gods and their home Asgard. Asgard is more specifically meaning something like an enclosure of the Asir. The Asir is one of the nine worlds on their cosmic axis, represented by Yggdrasil, their Norse tree of life. The Asir pantheon of gods includes Odin, Tyr, Thor, and the goddess Frigg, Odin's wife. The word Ansus is from the Latinized plural word Ansis that evidently translated from Proto-German into Ansus, which means gods in general. In the Anglo-Saxon runes, it means deity and can refer to the Roman sky god Jupiter that they associate to Odin. I have one aside comment. The Etruscan civilization that flourished in central Italy between the 8th and 3rd century BC Use the word Aesir to refer to gods too, which is very similar and predates the Norse usage of that word by hundreds of years. Some say it a coincidence. Nevertheless, the meaning of this goes deeper because A ah or Ask in Old English and Askir in Old Norse meant ash tree, symbolizing Yggdrasil. The Old English A ah meaning ash and ask also means spear for the wood was used for spear shafts and in anglo-saxon ask is the name of a ritual spear in fact in old irish the word gath or goth means spear and also means ray and radius the words ray and radius were found in the oak island prophesy series videos unlike the old english word god in old norse good However, the Os and As also means God, but was never adopted into Christian usage. The Icelandic Os Ansus for the God rune is referring to Odin as Aged Garter and is translated into Aged God. In the following excerpt from an Icelandic poem, it outlines Odin's position in the Norse pantheon. Os is Aged God and Prince of Asgard and Lord of Valhalla. Bahia is their heaven for fallen soldiers that died in battle. I don't believe in coincidences that the Potu stone, also found in Oklahoma, also has the AG runes as seen in the Heavener rune stone. So I'm going to take a little aside trip from the Heavener translation to take a few minutes to translate the Potu stone that will help clarify the Heavener rune stone translation. In 1976, the Potu stone was discovered by schoolboys playing at a construction site 10 miles southwest of the Heavener rune stone. The runes are one and a half by two inches in height, carved on a handheld sized piece of sandstone. Only a replica is on display and purportedly the original stone is under lock and key at a local museum. The Potu stone runes translate into G-A-O-I-E-A-L-T-H. Note the GA appears again in the same position as on the Heavener rune stone. Once again, these runes are read from right to left as in Hebrew. So for convention, we'll turn them around and separate them into the respective abbreviations. The Thuriza rune represents the sound of TH and means giant. Giant could mean a big opposing being or was a disguised analogy for the plural word Drutnar gods that are not necessarily physically large, but larger than life deities and their descendants, whom Odin is one. Thurza can also mean thorn to symbolize Odin's spear that pierced him while hanging from Yggdrasil to receive the wisdom of the runes because he is irrevocably linked to his spear Grungnir. And strangely enough, or maybe not, Thurza can represent a phallic symbol. Let's hop right into this translation. The Rook runestone was noted to make a reference to the Ostrogoth King Theodoric the Great. This bronze weight inlaid with silver was issued by the Roman prefect Catilinius sometime between 493 and 526 AD and displays the THL for the name Theodoric. The DN letters on the top mean Dominus Noster, our Lord and a prefect is a military or civil ranking official of the Roman Empire. In Old Greek, Greek, Latin, and English, the name Thaddeus has a large number of alternate spellings. Thaddeus, Theatus, Theodoros, Theodore, just to name a few. 
so it appears the Potu stone could be connected to Theodoric the Great. Why the veneration of this king hundreds of years later is because he became a noble hero throughout the ages. Legendary stories passed down through oral history turned Theodoric into a swashbuckler under the assumed name of Diedrich von Bern. These tales of old survived well into the 16th century. Further explanation of Theodoric the Great will occur later in this video when the word Tad, the short form of the name Theodoric, is found on the Heaven of Runestone. The vowels A-E-I-O finish the altered name of Theodoric. Ancient Greek and Greek words were spelled the way they were pronounced. The Potu stone runes appear to translate the name Thalio, using the Latin or Greek suffix E-I-O, which is loosely saying from Theodoric. Thalius uses the E-I-U-S suffix for of Theodoric, which actually sounds like Thaddeus. There's a second possible translation of the Potu runes that's just as interesting as the first. The T-H-L could symbolize Thule. That's Latin and Greek without the vowels that describes a far off place. In classical and medieval literature, Altima Thule was Latin for the farthest most Thule, which was a metaphor meaning for a distant place located beyond the borders of the known world. Sometimes Altima Thule was a Latin name used for Greenland and Iceland. And there was also believed to be a mystical island of Thule, which is possibly where the Heavener expedition thought they landed. The string of A-E-O-I vowels could symbolize anemoi without the consonants. Anemoi means winds. Scribal and older abbreviations often were missing the N and M, as we saw in my Oak Island Prophesy series translations. However, normally there's a line above the remaining letters to indicate the letters are missing. The significant distinction between vowels and most consonants is the passage of air from the lungs that is unrestricted. This then got me thinking about Aeolus, which is the Greek god of winds. The winds are often conceived as horse-shaped gods or spirits, and horse spirits were explained in my Renee's Le Chateau video. Therefore, this second possible version of the Potu translation could be saying something like Thul Animo, or in English, unknown world winds. And if you add the meaning of the AG, it would be unknown world reached by winds, Odin gods, gift of sacrifice. And now back to my regularly scheduled Heaven or Runestone translation of Tad Emo AG. The next three runes spell out Tad. The T rune for Tiwaz symbolizes Tyr, the Norse god of law, honor, and justice, and is surprisingly represented in the younger Futhark alphabet. Odin slowly began to replace Tyr as their chief all-father god. And as this transition happened, it appears things began to change in the Norse Ashir pantheon. Evidently, there was a nuance of difference between the elder Futhark upright arrow for a T and the short twig younger Futhark one-sided hook, indicating a difference of meaning as well as a difference of pronunciation, which probably boiled down to perhaps an unaspired T rather than an excess puff of air in an aspired T pronunciation. Romans identified Tyr with Mars, and his martial origin stretched back to the German sky god Dyrus, which was associated to Zeus. The arrow was thought to symbolize cosmic force. Each language had a slightly different spelling and pronunciation of this rune represented a T in Old Norse, Old English, Old German, and Gothic, Proto-German. Over time, Tyr came to rep represent the divine law, bravery, and most importantly, victory. Interestingly, the modern English word deity comes from this rune. Tyr's reign as the leader of the gods of Asher in Norse mythology began to significantly diminish as Odin's popularity rose. Superseding Tyr's importance, perhaps the use of the hook T versus the older upright arrow could represent this transition. This must have been why Tyr purportedly became Odin's son in some later Norse lore. Interestingly enough, Tyr is also associated with sacrifice for losing his spear-carrying hand to a wolf to save mankind. Out of all of the elder Futhark runes, Ansus and Tiwas in particular were considered to have magical or divine significance during the early Futhark period. 
And these two runes just happen to be the two that are found in Younger Futhark on the Heavener runestone. Thought-provokingly, the Tango Garda stone, dated circa 7th century, found in Gotland, Sweden, has a Latin-looking A and underneath what looks like a T was T to the left of my captions. However, in the big picture, the arrow of some sort is actually the upper part of the mast of a ship. This next A is from the Elder Futhark alphabet, representing Odin's rune and the rune of communication, but can also represent Odin's quest of wisdom from the unconscious to the conscious, which brings us to the next rune, Dagas. Dagas means day, awakening, those things that can be seen clearly by the light of day. From the mist is a rising clarity of consciousness that is emerging into the daylight, for this renewal is a new day dawning. The invisible is visible. The essence of the sun is bestowing wisdom. The word day in Old English has an inference of lifetime, literally meaning life day. If you've been keeping track, we now have translated the ending AG and the three letters TAD for TAD. TAD is a diminutive of the name Thaddeus. The name Thaddeus means heart or courageous. The name Theodore means gift of God, given by God, God's gift. Theo means God, and Doron means gift. Additionally, Thaddeus and Theodore have an array of nicknames to include, but not limited to, Tad, Thad, Tadio, Tadio, Tadzio, They, Ted, Teddy, Tim, Todd. Tad could be a reference to Theodoric the Great, but to be fair, let's look at a few other famous people with the name Tad. Tad is an anglicized form of the Gaelic name Teach or Tad which had an extremely long line of Irish nobility stretching back from the 9th to the 17th century. On top of that, one of Jesus' apostles was named Thaddeus and was also known as Jude of James. And as profiled earlier, the rock rune reportedly cites Theodoric the Great, king of the Ostrogoths, and the eventual ruler of all of Italy circa 500 AD. The Ostrogoths and the Visigoths played a major role in the fall of the Roman Empire and the emergence of medieval Europe with the Germans filling the political void left by the Romans' centralized government. Theodoric the Great's Roman name was Flavius Theodoricus. Flavius means he had golden hair. Theodoricus ends in a personal adjective, I-C-U-S suffix, which means belonging to or derived from or connecting with, indicating a nomina genitalia, and otherwise known as a clan name. Interestingly enough, his mother was baptized Catholic, and his father was an Aryan Ostrogoth king. In fact, there was a number of Gothic kings named Theodoric, and as well Frankish kings named Thuderic, which means people ruler in German. Why hundreds of years later is Theodoric the Great being idolized and honored in runic carvings? After Theodoric the Great's death, he became famous as the swashbuckling Dietrich von Bern. Legends of Dietrich's battles against other men, beasts, dragons, giants, and dwarfs are found in Theodric Saga of Bern, in Old Norse dated circa 1250. Stories of Dietrich's exploits were brought down through the ages by oral history. This saga was possibly transmitted by the Hanseatic League of Merchants, a confederation of German guilds that I've noticed has a direct connection to the Brothers of the Sword guilds in the Livonian city of Riga along the Baltic Sea. These sagas and poems reiterate threads of historical events in different settings, but there was no question that the protagonist was Theodoric the Great. The earliest mention of Theodoric is on the rock runestone carved in Sweden circa the 9th century, where he is referred to as Marings, which was Theodoric's family name. According to an old English poem from the 10th century named Dior, Theodoric ruled the castle of Marings. A possible contender with the name Theodore prior to Theodoric the Great was another dragon slayer, Saint Theodore of Amasaeus, who was venerated as a warrior saint that was martyred in the early 4th century and was also known as Theodore Tiro. St. Theodore was the iconic dragon slayer of the horsemen with the spear purportedly overcoming evil. 
Notice the similar spelling to Tyr with Tyro. And if you've been following along with my videos, the word Tyro appears as a reference to chevaliers, a horseman, and knight or knight of the order of an honor of merit. The next three runes spell out E-M-O. Iwa means horse to signify the relationship, love, loyalty, and trust between horse and rider. Or it can be thought of as two horses walking in sync. Iwas is the lover's card in tarot. It is similar to the concept of yin and yang, where all things that exist are inseparable, but are contradictory opposites. And this harmonization of balance gives birth to all things. The physical body and the spiritual soul are the linchpins of this rune for love and loyalty. Manas for M means man, mankind, and humanity signifying the shared fates of human beings. Odin's quest for knowledge and wisdom should be honored by man and emulated. Mind over matter and what really matters. Humans must achieve the maximum of their potential using brain power to fuel the way. This is an awakening and an awareness of our divine ancestry, the cosmic laws, the power of the mind, and the intellectual design of God, and man joined into the shared consciousness of the collective realm. Othala is the O rune. The original core meaning of Othala is believed to be from the old High German word of Odel or Opel for noble, thus covering a wide array of meanings of title, birthright, distinguished, moral, superior, and admirable. In essence, the concept stems from a Latin word that infers something notable. Othala symbolizes legacy, homeland, and clan. What type of legacy will you leave on this world? Othala is a wealth of things that cannot be bought or taken to the bank. The emo runes spell out the prefix for blood. The emo prefix was found on my Stila Zion translation. English speakers would recognize this more easily if you put an H in front of it for hemo, a prefix meaning blood. The H is silent in many spellings and this is seen also in the old spelling of Jerusalem. In my Stila Zion video, the emo prefix was followed by the illi suffix, which in Latin is an adjective denoting a characteristic of something. For example, the words volatile or juvenile. Note in this case the characteristics of blood is in the plural form. The Latin prefix for blood is aimo, and in Greek, haima. These are then modified to hemo and hema in English. In fact, English has over 1,300 words that start with the prefix hemo. Could it be that the same message of blood is on the heaven or runestone as found on the seal of Zion that is possibly referring to a bloodline? Hendrik Williams, professor in Nordic languages at the University of Uppsala in Sweden, found the heaven or runestone disturbing because of the lack of typical words found for that time period of 500 to 1,000 years ago. However, what if they were abbreviations to save space, time, and effort? If the hemo blood prefix is attached to the AG symbolism that signifies the nouns Odin, gods, and sacrifice, then the full translation of the heaven or runestone would be something like heart blood, Odin, gods, gift of sacrifice. Or if Tad is specifically indicating Thaddeus, Theodore, or Theodoric, it could be translated as Theodore's blood, Odin, God's gift of sacrifice. These are the messages that I found for the heaven or rune stone. In Hebrew, as well as in many other Semitic languages, each letter represents a concept or idea, and this is also true for the runes. I believe this is another reason for the presence of both the elder and younger Futhark alphabets. The first three runes spell out Tad. Tyr meaning divine law or victory, Ansus meaning Odin and communication, Dagas meaning day and awakening. Then the next three runes spell out Emo, for Iwas meaning love and loyalty, Manas meaning man and mind, and Othala meaning legacy and homeland. And then the AG for Odin, God's gift of sacrifice. So then we have something like victory, Odin, awakening, love, man, legacy, of Odin God's gift of sacrifice. 
However, these concepts go deeper, and please allow me to give you a more in-depth interpretation of this message with the theme of pro bono riddled throughout it, meaning something for something. So the basic explanatory is Tyr, God of Sky and Justice, Odin, All-Father God, who interacts with man, bringing awakening, love, and man's legacy for Odin and the God's gift of sacrifice. But now let's take a second look at this message. Tiwaz, at first glance, appears to honor the Norse god of Tyr and his origins as the sky god. But on a second glance, the message is connecting the forces of the gods with the divine hook that binds heaven and earth. And this has been an ever-present theme throughout many of my translations. The binding of heaven and earth is represented by the Hebrew letter Bab. Now let's compare the Swedish-Norwegian short twig rune for Tiwaz and the Hebrew letter Bab. It appears that Tiwaz is binding heaven and earth and that Odin is man's connection between the divine and the earthly. So the more in-depth message can be translated into divine law binding heaven and earth of Odin's awakening for the love of mankind of his legacy made possible by Odin, God's gift of sacrifice. Let's get a feel for the happenings in Europe about the time the Heavener runestone was carved. In 897 AD, discord was running rampant from political instability in Italy. This left the Catholic Church relying on the largest of the European nobles. Pope Theodore II became entangled in the cadaver trial and had the former Pope Formosus's body exhumed, dressed in pontifical vestments, brought to the courtroom and charged with perjury, violating the canons prohibiting the translation of bishops, and coveting the papacy. All papal changes Pope Formosus made were annulled and his body was reburied in a common grave. Pope Theodore II died 20 days into his tenor, and no one is quite sure how he died. Obviously, the ripple effect of this time period must have reached many countries. Under conditions like that, I would be tempted to sail across the Atlantic Ocean seeking more tranquil waters. My next video will connect the runestone translations with the Freemasons, unless something else draws my attention in the midst of my research. Please subscribe, like, and comment to support my channel. Mm -hmm.